For those of you who like these videos, here's another marketing video. In this one, I'm going to lay it all out, explain how things work, where I think things are going, as to why. But let's start right here and talk about the weather. And the red areas are the driest and the blue areas are the wettest. As you can see, Kansas, Nebraska, large swaths of Iowa, Missouri, and even central Illinois are very, very dry. If you look in the corner near southwest Iowa, which is where we're at, uh, we are really dry. And on this map, you can see the year 2022 on the bottom and 2023 on top, which would be the difference in soil um, root zone moisture. Uh, again, the darker red means it's drier. As you can see from the maps, uh, we're quite dry. Um, we have not had much moisture this year, uh, although for calendar year date, we're actually a hint above. But it does not make up for the over one foot of rainfall shortfall that we had in 2022. Then on this map, you can see it going back through many years, uh, and again, this is all off the NOA website, but you can go back through many years and see the rainfall uh, data and soil moisture. Uh, root zone moisture seen here uh, shows that we are progressively getting drier and drier. As expected, in May, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates another quarter point, but signaled a pause. Uh, in my opinion, the pause will coincide with the debt limit increase. Uh, I think the next meeting is like June 15th for the Fed and the debt limit has to be increased sometime in that same time frame. So um, again, this is just my opinion, but I would say that they'll pause rate hikes at the same time that they reverse course to quantitative easing, which would be printing money for the government. Because they're probably not going to do quantitative tightening and raise debt limits. So I think that's when they're going to pause, and that's kind of going to be when the shoe starts to, to turn and goes down the other side of the mountain. But ultimately, don't ever trust the Fed because, I mean, look what Jerome Powell's opening remarks are, where it's to talk about the banking systems being safe and resilient or sound or resilient, whatever the hell kind of terms he used. And then immediately following that, um, several more bank stocks were plummeting at a very rapid rate, which there's a lot of them that are faltering. And, and I mean, when, you're, when your interest rates are what they are now versus what they had locked in investments for, and plus inflation, I mean, and this is happening for everybody, but it's, it's outpacing what they're making, which ultimately leads to banking collapses and economic scares and recession worries, and that leads to um, grains cooling off, just uh, people aren't going to go out and make large investments into a commodity uh, when when you have a uh, maybe no way to get the money to invest, or maybe there's other worries or recession worries. Which, if you watched my last video uh, and you saw the four quadrants, you had a quadrant where you had inflation, but you had slow growth. That's stagflation. And if you had um, dropping inflation and no growth, that's a disinflationary bust, which means recession or depression which is what I think we're sliding into. The screen here would be shares of Chinese imports. Uh, as you can see, the Chinese are largely switching to Brazilian uh, imports. Um, Brazil has over 80 million more acres that they could open up, which pretty much just dissolves the entire Midwest. Uh, the BRICS nations are aligning in things that they need. And unfortunately, unless we get more domestic use here in the United States, uh, agriculture may further uh, decline. Soybean profit and loss for all years. Um, you can look at the charts here. You can see where the uh, best return on investments come from on a uh, long-range chart. And here you're going to look at a November soybeans seasonal trend, which would be your fall delivery soybeans. You can see as to which months they're going to be high sales and low sales times. Um, looks to me like probably around June would be uh, your high time, June, July, maybe to sell your, your soybeans. But as you can see from the greenish teal line, we're in a decline in the spring, which means we're in an inverse year, which is not normal. 
as the chart moves away from the maroon line. And pretty much the same thing here with corn. Uh, new crop futures highs and the yellow lines would be December. The green would be uh, soybeans. You can see which months as a frequency as which ones is better. So if you took a yellow line, which is going to be corn, and you can see that May and June is going to be your two highest months to place sales for December. Uh, so right now in the next month would be technically, statistically, out of multiple years, your best time is to place sales for fall delivery corn. And a crush margins uh, soybean chart here. This would be uh, what basically what the difference. I mean, this is what your plants make, essentially. Um, that's how much margin they got. The more margin they have, obviously, the more they're making, the more they're going to be able to pay you. And you can see how the chart's uh, dropping quite a bit there. I mean, the, uh, we're really in a decline. So, you know, that's not good. And this video gets a little bit long-winded, but if you stick around, I explain pretty much how the entire system works and what direction I think things will go long-term and as to why. These bids were taken a few days ago, and they've been in a decline ever since, seeing a lot of forehandles in the markets. It's, however, one of the long-range farm economists that I subscribe to, you can see his predictions if you pause your screen. However, his predictions are likely to be BS, considering he's already changed them once per month. As I've explained in other videos, farming is a net zero profit industry, um, and that's showing up in a lot of different demographics. And again, we'll come into more of that later in the video here. But um, it's it's not good. I mean, the input costs and the mortgage costs are equal to what you make or more, and farm debt is skyrocketing. Um, for multiple reasons. Since 1973, 50 years of data here, after April 1st, we've always topped or at least met the, this, the February contract highs. So whatever the high was in February, after April 1st on corn, we've always exceeded it. The lowest time we ever exceeded it was by 1.5%. I believe in 2013. Regardless, that's still higher. So far for this year, we've not exceeded it. That's why I believe there's a rally in the cards. Probably be July. This is an inverse year, meaning the market was higher in the fall and has declined in the spring. It's only been done like four times, and I think most of those times are around recessions. Um, 08 would probably be a similar pattern. But normally... Your rally starts in April and ends in July. I've done a series of these videos uh, explaining how markets work, what I think markets will do, and as to why. This one I'm going to do the best job and hopefully recap everything as well as give you a full explanation. And then this will probably kind of end the series somewhat, but we will continue with marketing videos. Um, but it is important to watch the others because they are referenced in this video. There's just so much that goes into it. When I make up these kind of videos, there's always a lot of debate on buying ground, other stuff. and I'm just going to lay out some numbers here. So in our area, we're going to take about $130 per CSR 2 point to buy ground. And in our scenario here, we're going to look at CSR 2 and our yield goal average is going to give you your yield goal and that coincides with your rainfall so here's our yield 184 and there's our price of our ground uh, 84.50 and that was using our CSR of CSR 2 is 65 now for this scenario we're also buying 120 acre farm at 90 percent farmable because you never get 100 percent farmable which means it has 108 tillable acres on it so 108 tillable acres at 84.50 per acre is 1,014,000 now, if you come over here, you got your herbicide, fungicide, uh, chemical seed, fertilizer, and hydrous uh, property tax, planting, your harvest, tillage, other, you know, crop insurance, figured $435. And I'm figuring very conservatively, I mean, you might be over $100 on, the, on this, on hydrous, you might be $100 on dry fertilizer, you got lime, you could be $500 an acre, or maybe you'd be lucky and you could cut it down some more but we're just using some generic numbers there. <clears throat> anyway, if we take this 120 acre farm, a million fourteen thousand dollars, and say we could buy this thing for
for 30 years was 0% down. So if you have 30 years, current interest rate is going to be about 8%, and you're going to look at your, your uh, payment of $91,016 a year at 30 years. That's $842 an acre. And you... Okay, that's me walking to shop here. I'll take a little pause. Uh, we are at $842 an acre uh, payment on per tillable acre of your payment. So if your payment's $91,000 a year and you have 108 tillable acres, that's your payment per acre. If you're getting it for 5%, then this would be your tillable acre payment, $615. Now, if you come back over here to the cost to raise corn, because we're just doing corn in this scenario, soybeans actually worked out worse. So if you took 615, you added the 435 to it, there's your 1050. If you took the uh, payment per acre and you added your input cost to it, there's your payment per acre. So you'd have 132,000 a year input total costs, or you'd have 113 depending on your interest rates. Now, we'll get our yield goal times 108 tillable acres. That's going to give you 19,872 bushels of corn. If I sold all that corn at $7, 139,550, 109, you can read the screen here yourself, 435, because that was our multi year average, if you watch previous videos, $86,000. Now you come back over here and you compare these numbers of your total revenue minus these numbers. And I'm going to ask you guys, did you make money or did you lose money? Now, the statistic I just gave is very real world application to right now. I mean, if you're in our little area of Iowa and it was right now, it's pretty much what you could buy land for. Or, and that's if you could even find ground. That it's, the, the scenario is very uh, realistic in, in the sense of it's, it's current. But if you went back a few years to like 2020... You know, land was pretty low, and so let's rerun these numbers. So we're going to go in blue here, and say it was worth about 105 CSR too. So it'd be about 6,825 dollars per CSR, or, or, or to, uh, per acre. And you take 120 acre farm, it'd be 819 thousand dollars to the million. And we had cheap interest then, so you'd be looking at four percent, um, which would give you an annual payment of uh, 47,682, uh, or 441 dollars and 50 cents per acre, plus the three. 50 inputs, and the reason we have lower inputs is because back then anhydrous was cheaper, dry fertilizer was cheaper, seed, uh, you know, even your diesel fuel switches figure 350 versus the 435, so we had cheaper inputs. So we take our inputs, add them to our land payment, came out at $85,428 per year. Now, I think we're headed in a little bit better direction, but as I'd mentioned, we've been in a previous like 15 year 435 average. So you had eighty-six thousand dollars of revenue. So if you'd bought the ground at the right time, statistically as a whole, you'd basically broke even by a thousand bucks. You'd have broke even over the years. The ground would have paid for itself um, if you'd have bought the ground at the right time as a statistic whole. The problem was at the time we were in a five-year average of three hundred and fifty corn, and that would have only given you a sixty-nine thousand five hundred a year total revenue with an eighty-five thousand a year uh, payment. So you'd still been in a loss during the time. So. As a statistic whole, it would have paid to buy ground timing-wise. But as a as a um, timing factor, if you have to write the check on an annual basis, so for somebody young wanting to start out, you'd have been at a loss. So given all these numbers and all these scenarios, I get these kids saying, well, I, I think I could start a farm with, with a shirt on my back. And I say, well, the only two things that are sellable here are corn and soybeans. How are you going to defy the odds? And if I'm doing it all wrong, and this is calling out the trolls, but if I'm doing it all wrong, the open door invite's still here to get out of the bank. Use these numbers I used. I just don't see where you're even going to be able to buy a track of ground. What bank's going to give you the money? And this is not to mention, this input cost, this is if you had equipment. That's just kind of what it costs to maintain it and use it, or maybe your, your dad would let you use the equipment not go out and buy the equipment. Some areas of the country are going to be better. I mean, you're going to have better yields, you're going to have better CSRs, but you're probably your price of your land is going to be uh, adjusted. It's going to be higher. Um, tractors and all that are probably going to remain about the same no matter where you're at. If you're a lot bigger farmer, you might get a, a break on these by a few dollars. 
but by all means does it make up the balance difference. You can buy ground. If you're a farmer and you've been farming, you can buy ground. What you do is you use your current equity, you borrow against it, and you expand, and you basically operate the less the other ground you have at a little bit reduced income to pay for this ground after so many years. Uh, that'll get bought down. That's why I say debt is money. And you can watch that video um, um, separately. But you can expand if you're a current uh, farmer. Or if you had some form of supplemental income. But where an investor comes into this and really shines is when this million dollars or 800000 you know, they have the ability to write a check for it. And it's done. It's taken care of. So if they just write the check, then they're going to go look at 5% return. Meanwhile, the ground grows in value over time, and that'll allow them to sell it. So ultimately, uh, if you're a farmer and you're looking to expand, you're going to probably deprive your current income to pay for more ground unless you just magically are able to save up all that income over the years. If you're a young farmer, there's absolutely no way, unless you're going to do something different with the ground, than the scenarios I've given here, or if you have a job in town or supplemental income. But if you are, for myself, with the clothes on your back, saying, I want to start a farm, my own farm, I can use somebody else's equipment, but I want to buy my own ground, uh, and the only thing I can really raise around here is commercial size, yeah, there's no fucking way. An economist, Ray Dalio, he made up the four quadrants. These are quite easy to understand. We literally put a T right here across, right on the right on the page here. And we have rising inflation, slowing inflation, slow growth, or accelerating growth. That's which direction things are going. And then when you get to a direction, it describes what happens. So we have a deflationary bust, which is a recession or depression. Stagflation, inflationary rise, or disinflationary boom. Now we had a lot of inflation when they printed all the COVID money, right? So we had rising inflation, and we had accelerating growth because of it, because people were using their phones, investing in stocks, and everything else. So that caused an inflationary rise. But then the Fed came in and they put the brakes on inflation. So we began to slow growth. So this line started going this way. We began to slow growth. But for a while, our inflation was still rising. That was causing stagflation. What you're starting to see now is you still have a slow growth factor. But you're seeing slowing inflation. Meaning the Fed's starting to get inflation slowed down, so we're not booming off this inflationary rise line. We're starting to slow down. And that's leading us down here towards the recession era. So our growth is slowed. We've, we've stopped this. We went this way a year ago. So we're, we're probably over here in this spectrum. And inflation's r dropping. So we're kind of like down in here. So we're probably still kind of in the stagflation environment. But we're right into that line heading towards recession. Now, when we were under Donald Trump as president, we had accelerating growth, but we had slowing inflation. The reason we had slowing inflation is because he was able to make commodities cheaper. And we'll come back to that. But what that leads to is cheaper things, but leads to an inflationary boom. But it comes at the expense of others. But back to matters more at hand of grain talk discussion where markets are going to go, I think they're headed in this direction. If you look at the dollar index starting about June of 2022 is when really inflation really kind of reached a high. I know corn reached a high there in May. And if you draw a line on this, you can see we just went way up, way up until about mid to late summer. And then we started a very rapid decline. And there were some flare-ups here in, in March, but now we're at a decline. We're hovering around that 100 at the lowest end, and up in here is like a 105. We've just kind of been right in this range for quite a while. And uh, uh, over 100 grain never does very good, and we just kind of float in this range. But the dollar's been, been coming down for quite a while. 
If you compare that with grain, we reached a high in May of 2022. We hit a peak, and ever since then, we've been in a decline, and there was an upswing here in the fall, but it never met as high as it did before. Uh, and then this was this period here, because the Fed also put the brakes on right in here. So this period here would be really your stagflation, and now we're starting to slide to that disinflationary recession level. The reason I think grain will go up locally we have as high as an 80 cent basis that's it's going up the basis is firming which basis firming means it's increasing we've at least in my life i don't think i've ever seen a basis this high uh, to have the cbot as low as it is and the basis as high as it is i think with that being said i think your general trend is still going to be downwards but I think you'll have a, a spike like this. Because even though a chart goes down long term, still doesn't mean you don't have a few peaks in there. And you know, that's your, your, your band there, where you're going to have to figure out where that's going to peak and when. And I, I think it's coming. And I think you're going to be very short lived with it. And that'll be where you, if you have old crop. Uh, corner slave means place your sales and maybe place uh, future sales going forward. This is the part that most people don't get. You have people. People spend their money on food, gasoline, money goes to cars, a house, clothing, whatever they want to spend their money on. But if you have a commodity problem such as weather events raising food or low market prices causing a lack in production of gasoline whatever it is the price of these items goes up significantly in turn you have less money to buy these other things so more of the money shifted here and less to here. And that starts affecting markets on things. If you're a car manufacturer, and this is the CEO with lots of money signs above him, same with the stockholders, everything else, then you have the lonely peons who get nothing to actually build them or the people that are struggling to buy them, buy the item. You could go out and double production on the manufacturing plant, not buy your stocks back, actually invest it back into the company, do the things they probably should do, but then that starts to chop off money for this guy or the stockholders, so they don't do that. They almost, they've got a monopolized market. So they don't really want to deprive themselves, so they just really make things more expensive. I mean, it really should be competition in the market, which is what we have in farming, which keeps prices lower. So all of a sudden these people are spending more money on these things, and it means less money for this, which means less money for this person, which you could consider this to be your 1 to 10 percent populace, your, your population, your high elites. So all of a sudden if their sales get hurt, they're going to find a place to balance equities. And they're going to balance that from making things like food much cheaper. Get some of that money flowing over here. Or in the words of Donald Trump, get that gasoline or, or oil price down to $25 a barrel. Get the housing picked up. Get everything else picked up. You know what happens? So these things pick up. But then the company that was producing this went flat broke. And when it goes broke, there's nothing left. And these consumers still need it. So how do you... you you're able to pay for the car that you bought because you're able to buy cheap gas for it. But now you can't get gas. And the last remaining few gallons of gas are going to be very high priced. So now we have a problem. How you make money is you produce things. That's real money. You produce things. People go out 
they make a garden, they raise a melon, they sell the melon. They produced it from the earth. Pretty much all things stem from a commodity in, in some way, shape, or form. The government debt, everybody likes to talk about, the $32 trillion. In a, in a nutshell, what that is, is money that we didn't have. We were paying people uh, money, so you got these government workers who are collecting checks for stuff that's not producing anything. They're not raising a melon in their garden. They're not mining an element from the earth. They're shuffling a piece of paper that didn't exist three years ago. As to why they're shuffling that piece of paper is because that's a job for them, and that's a job creation, and that's a job for them because they need an income. But again, it doesn't produce anything. Now, why they need a job is because other jobs, real jobs or real production, has been lost. We didn't bring enough in to pay for these, and the government doesn't make any. The government's the people. So where'd the money come from? Well, in a giant sense, they printed it. When you print money, you devalue money, meaning the more it's out there, the more people have. I mean, you might have 20 $1 bills in your wallet instead of five $1 bills in your wallet, but the buying power of those 20 equaled what the five did several years previous because they just kept printing more. That is literally inflation. I mean, that is inflation in front of your eyes. And the root cause of that inflation is right here with government debt. Now, if you have runaway inflation, you could devalue your currency to where your, your money is totally worth nothing. It'd be no better than just a roll of toilet paper. The Federal Reserve likes to keep an annual rate growth at 2%. That's their goal. And the reason it stays at 2% is what they claim is it's a constant rate of growth, which you could argue whether that's a good or bad thing. And if you've ever heard the term real or real interest rates, that would be what it was in reality versus their arbitrary value. Now, the what the Fed doesn't tell you is that there's no way to really cover this, and you'll never have 2% inflation or realistic inflation with the way things are measured. So... This is a steak, and this is a canned dog food. So you come into things like their indexes, and you change the way it's measured. Well, steaks really went up. It's 6 7%. We don't want to show any more than 2%. So we'll just substitute the dog food for the steak. We'll just carry that. Well, this is cheaper, so that means there's no inflation. So we can add that into our calculations. Well, we still have a problem, and this 2%, we're still not able to meet it with these calculations, Probably because we're giving all our money here recklessly. So we'll go back up here to the people. We'll just take a, f a little bit more from them. They don't need a pay raise. Let's keep their wages a little bit cheaper. Hey, I'm not selling any of these cars. I need to have all this money in my pocket. And uh, things aren't going so well with the sales on these cars because the people don't have as much expendable income. And I need to make sure I'm still in that 1% category. Well, what we'll have to do is come back over here to commodities. And we'll just have to give them to produce a little cheaper so that all the things that actually go into the raw materials side in the people's checkbooks is, you know, that way they get just a, a little bit more. So the, the, the two cents they had now, they got just a little bit more money. So now they can just kind of half-ass afford that car. Or we'll drop interest rates down to 0% so they can afford that car so we can keep lying in this guy's pocket. When the truth of the matter is, it all originated from the government debt in the first place. So as you can see, the whole system's fucked, and the commodities producers is in a long-term decline. And this is the reason why. And the reason the Fed doesn't want to give out real interest rates, because they know if we had runaway true real runaway inflation, which is pretty much what we have anyway, it would start to collapse the dollar. I mean, our reserve currency status is already in question. What I could find on the internet going back to 2011, and these are in billion bushels of corn, and you guys can do your own uh, fact-checking here, but 2011, 12.4, 12, 10.8, 12, and that would have been your drought year with the really short crop when prices really went sky high. 13, 13.8, 14, 14.4, you can read it for yourself here, 15. 
Then we had some really big crop years under the Donald Trump uh, time here. Uh, and I couldn't find 19, but you can see we had some pretty big crop years. But then things started to decline a little bit. Uh, this would be derecho, and this would be prevent plant years. Then we had 21, a lot bigger uh, crop. And then in 22, we took a big drop. And we know that the yields are falsified if you watched the last video. But you can see it hasn't changed dramatically in 10 years. So as I talked about previously, have yields went up? Uh, not by much. What is corn going to do? Talk about corn only here. The economy as a whole. We're still in stagflation, but we're headed towards recession. The dollar index, where are we at? And sales. Sales are poor because of the dollar index. Anything over 100, you're not going to sell much. If that were to drop back into the um, 70s, the price would be super high. Um, everything else would be inflationary, but it'd be super high. If it goes up to like 105, the sales are going to be very poor. And they're pretty poor right now, around the 100 level. Uh, I'd really like to see it in the 80s. You know, is that going to happen soon? I don't know. Uh, weather. Is it going to be dry? Wet? You know, I don't know. Not a clue. Uh, looking at the maps where we started the videos, it's kind of looking pretty dry, but we are getting rain. If we are in stagflation, we stay in stagflation because of how it's calculated, inflation will get down to about 3 to 3.5%, three then it'll start to go back up. And we are following a short crop, but that's following a big crop. So we had high prices this year because of several reasons, but it also followed a little bit shorter crops. Then we had a short crop, so that's going to have a longer tail, so probably going to take a little while yet. Fed has their next FOMC meeting, I think June 15th or 16th. Interest rates have been going up, but I think they're about a pivot. They've basically called for a pivot or pause. A lot of places are saying that they need to actually drop rates. We don't. We will see. Jerome Powell has said they're not going to, or they're going to remain flat. At the same time, you got the debt ceiling here looming, which will probably take place about the same point, because this is kind of like a... A pivot point. Right now they're in quantitative tightening, then they're going to go to quantitative easing, which means printing money. This means they're not printing money, this means they're printing money. And usually when you start to see it, things will remain flat or they'll start to decline or they'll start to decline rates. Now, the economy is starting to go this way. So usually when the economy starts to go down in the dumps, it's just about the time you know the pivot. They go up till they break something and they start to go the other way. And this will out accelerate what the Fed does. So the Fed will be back here. Economy is falling like a drop. And once it hits a certain point, the Fed will really pour the coals to it and try to revive it with more QE, more printing. <laughs> and then this area here is where you'll really start to see commodities as they hedge against inflation really start to pick up. I'm predicting that's around the year 2025, 2026, somewhere in there, but it really depends on our weather factors. If you follow this channel, you know that we were super dry in the western corn belt areas. So we'll call this the west and we'll call this the east in the year 2022. And we really started drying out late 20, 2022 is the peak. Uh, 2021 was kind of a transition. It's like sliding a dimmer switch. So you start going dry, you get drier, drier, really dry. Then we start going back to a little bit wetter. And they say, oh, I think we're flipping patterns. Was it El, El Nino or whatever is moving in now? But we were really dry in 22. So I went back and I went the NOA and I just simply looked up all the years of rainfall data for, for my area. And I recorded it and I tried to look at the patterns. I tried to look at the measures to see where I kind of thought things were going. Now, Dr. Elwin Taylor, he's a climatologist. He wrote an article in 2020 that thought that 2025 would be your peak driest year. Maybe he missed the date and it was 2022. I don't know. But uh, and maybe it will be on uh, slated for 2025. I think 2023 is still going to be a little bit dry, just because uh, we don't have much subsoil moisture, and it's going to take very timely rains. Although we're, we're looking pretty good at the time of making this video. Then the eastern corn belt, as I understand, I don't I don't live there, but the eastern corn belt has been pretty wet, wet, wet. And 23, we don't we don't know. Uh, one forecast shows it drying out. The other one shows it could be a little wetter. But for the western corn belt, or where I'm at, western Iowa, 23, we really don't know what we're going to get. Um, and 24, 
I would personally predict uh, increasing wetness, and then maybe around 25, 26, 27, somewhere in there, according to the flood year statistics, that's where we're going to get really, really wet. Um, and those are the years we started kind of flooding out. Now, an old farmer once told me uh, everything comes in threes, which kind of makes sense. If you study economic cycles, you know, it kind of goes in threes. So if you have a drought, uh, three years, as usually most economic cycles are like five to six, maybe seven years. But three years of up due to drought. And we turn, we go three years of wet. So you may have three years of declining prices uh, due, to, due to wet. Now to give you about your six-year bubble. So really a lot of commodities, which I explained how they influence the economy, would be kind of be dictated out of weather patterns. Now if you're in the eastern Corn Belt, I have no clue. Maybe it'll be a flip-flop because they've been wetter. Maybe they'll go three years of drier and we'll be three years of wetter. Um, don't know. Uh, kind of happened in 2012 here. We didn't have a bad crop. But just say, for example, if you come in with 23, it's like a 14, 7 billion, a 24, 15 billion, 25, a 13, 5, you know, so forth, whatever, how we want to get on the line here. Now, in my prediction, we're in the year 23, we're in mid-23. And we basically, we came into the year high. So here's mid-year, mid-year. We came into the year high, and we've been in a decline like this in, in commodity prices, corn, corn, soybeans. Now... I think we could get through maybe later summer, there'll be a transition or there'll be a blip. I still think that's going to be your, your peak market rally. Then I think we'll further our decline slide. And we'll see what kind of harvest we get or what kind of weather we get. We just, I, I don't know that yet. I also kind of feel like, you know, at this point here, we started in the recession in 2022. And we'll come back to that. But I really feel like we really slide in the recession. So I think it's only going to get blipped. We're going to go down. So here's the year 24. We're going to plow into this hard landing. And the Fed's basically said they're going to re reverse, uh, go back to QE in 24. So that means your money will start. So it's going to take a while. And then you'll probably see commodities start to come back up, which would signal and line up with that year 2025, which if Ellen Taylor is right, would be a drought year. Could be wet here on the Western Corn Belt. It's the Western Corn Belt and the Eastern Corn Belt often seem like the weather is almost opposite. Um, I noticed a pattern. If it's raining on the east coast, then it's not raining here. And if it's raining here, it's not raining on the on the east coast. So there's definitely a flip-flop to it. Now, if you've ever studied our economy, in the 1819s, we were already starting to slide into a recession. Uh, in 2020, we really plowed off the face of the earth because of the COVID deal. So we basically went into a COVID recession. And then the government came in, they stimulated all this economy, so it shot way up, inflation shot way up. But now we're cooling back, and by the year 2024, we really could hit you know our floor back here, which is basically returning to the economy we were in before. Problem is, we'll be worse off than we were before, uh, because you know if we were sliding into one and people weren't doing good then, how are they going to absorb the same things? But usually prices at store are not going to go down to where they once were. I mean, if you've got 2% inflation on top of your current inflation, that's still growth on top of what you had. It's not deflation to return to old prices, then return to 2%. So if you looked at this in surge, we were just kind of a flat line. And then the COVID bubble just kind of burst us like this. So it wasn't like your standard economic cycles that grow like this. It was just a flat line, just a burst, just a bubble in it. It's just a mass inflow of um, cash from printing at a very quick rate. And obviously they're trying to give us the return to the pre-COVID levels, which really weren't working before. Now the problem is because of all this money and because of all this inflation, it'll linger. Inflationary depression, I really think that the Fed will have to reverse direction. They really, I mean, we're, we're in here and they should be start and reverse it now, but they won't. They'll plow it off the face of the earth, then they'll reverse course and they plow it the other way. They're supposed to level out the economy. It was the idea behind it, quote unquote. And they don't do it. They just cause economic cycles. So instead of just kind of getting the line to go like this, they just highs and lows. So if you start to take those things into account, you start to look at the year 2024, probably going to be at some low uh, dollar amounts. And like I say, 25, what is it going to be dry? You know, that's our question mark, but we're going to see printing, which could drive the prices up. So depending on what kind of crop you get, it might be, this, you know, sky's the limit. Or it might just be kind of a slow increase line, but I still think the longer term kind of looks decent. And if you get a lot of good weather, I'm going to put, you know, 25 
to 29 those years, somewhere in there. I'm just going to say beans are going to be, um, let's just say low end of 1190. And I think the high end is going to be about 1295, maybe 1350, something like that. And I'd say that corn with a two and a half to one ratio is going to put you in that fine line of close to five dollars. So if you wanted to figure the corn in the range, probably 370 to 510. Just kind of where I think we're going to set a lot of us. I think that'll be your, your new numbers, your new categories. I think that's kind of where the direction we're going. Uh, and considering the amount of inflation we've taken, the price of equipment, it's not going to reverse. Uh, since the Fed claims we're in reversal modes, doesn't that mean that the uh, equipment should go back down the pre-COVID price? Well, it won't. And that's pretty much the point of the video is things just continue to get worse. If any of you guys have actually made it this far in the video, uh, we're going to do one last scenario here. We're going to take a thousand acre farm and pretend it's 900 acres uh, farmable, which you probably wouldn't even get that much out of it uh, on a thousand acres around here. And out of that thousand acres, we're going to say it's half in debt, 50%. Uh, most banks will allow you to go up to 52%. Uh, in debt. That's about the maximum cutoff according to farm credit bylaws or without a supplemental income or whatever, but you still have to have the income to pay for 50%. Anyway, let's just say you could go 50% in debt. 900 acre farm and the CSR2 in our area, say you're going to get a, a yield with a crop insurance protected yield of 85%. So 100, 900 acres, 190 bushel acre corn, pretend we're doing all corn, 171,000 bushels. 85% would be about 145,350 bushels of protected level. Now that mortgage, I went ahead and I did a 30 year for 5.5% and I took a value of $8,500 an acre for the ground. Came out of just short of 300,000 bucks per year. Now, if you look at that, we're going to split the difference on those on those yields and say 160,000 bushels because that's kind of, you wouldn't want to go full scale every year because you're not going to have full scale every year, but you're not going to have crop insurance. Crop insurance is going to vary on your yield, your price, whatever revenue. So we're going to take a 450 price. Well, I was going to go 435, but we're going to go 450 price. And how we got that, we go back here to the Iowa State. We're going to run averages for so many years. 450 price, $720,000 of gross revenue. And seven hundred twenty thousand dollars of gross revenue, and let's just go ahead and take the the three hundred thousand or short of three hundred thousand um, dollars mortgage right off of that. You got your fixed cost inputs. You know that's just your seed, your chemical, your fertilizer. We talked about that already. Four hundred five thousand a year. Average income across America is fifty four thousand dollars. And let's just say you had a pet, you had no equipment, you're going to buy a full lot of machinery. Half a million bucks doesn't go anywhere and um, let's just say you need to spend a hundred thousand dollars per year to get your line of equipment because like i say say you had none now if you didn't have any you had to hire it then obviously this would be much higher but you might be able to balance it out anyway regardless um if you start to look at three hundred thousand and your inputs really your mortgage you, you couldn't even pay the you know, over a course of time, you, you couldn't even make it pay. It absolutely would not pay. So really, the only way to make this pay would be more like maybe 35% debt. And maybe no machinery. Uh, maybe have something like a higher yield point on a cheaper price to buy it. But this is precisely why even somebody that was maybe inherited a Say you inherited 500 acres and you wanted to die. You can't even do it. I mean, when I bought a bulldozer, I mean, I don't know a single contractor. If you walked into the Caterpillar dealership and they said, yes, you need 87% down payment. And then you're going to have to go to town after you run this thing all day and get a town job and work the nighttime shift at the town job. There's zero time for sleeping. But work the town shift job to make your personal living. They would never sell a piece of equipment. You would never create a business. And let's take a look at this. The corn yield chart in the United States. We go up, so here's the years. Fan this out a little bit. 2012 would be your big drop year, so it's going to be your premium price. 
that, like I spoke about in my last video, we falsified this last year. We know that. So it was actually probably more like down here. But if you really draw a line, it looks to me like we've pretty much leveled out in corn yields for 10 years. Now let's take a look at the data. Went over to this chart and I compared it. 05 to 09 for calendar year, we averaged about $3.22, 10 to 14, 537, 15 to 20 at 349 in 2023 so far, 527. So as you can see, our lows for five years were just a shade higher than the previous five year lows. So it goes five years up, five years down, five years up, five years down. But this is going to have to end up being higher than this to prove that we're going forward. And the fact it's currently lower with the declining market already looks to me like things are getting worse. And if you had a declining yield or we've leveled out, that costs have continuously went up. And as I stated in my last video, John Deere tractors have went up by 6.5% per year. You are watching a wealth cap develop for your eyes. Now, if you've made it to this point in the video and you still don't believe me, then you're absolute complete under a rock living moron there's two possible outcomes i think are going to happen um and for the following reasons scenario number one is i think the fed will pivot uh coming up here in june which is what we already talked about and then by 2024 they'll be getting uh rate cuts maybe a little sooner or maybe a little bit after the first year doesn't matter um it'll be late 23 or 24. the reason is, is because that's basically what the fed has said uh the only time it would maybe get done faster is if the economy just tanks 2024 is an election year um jeremy grantham an economist has studied election cycles to where the point of election occurs ending point of their term and about a midpoint is at the most stimulus and you can follow the bubbles on weather or stimuluses or a combination of all. And, you know, when they get in, they start spending their money to make campaign promises to wherever promises would be. And it accelerates, and there's usually a midterm election where it's going to go, you know, whichever direction it goes from there. Now, if they pivot, that means there'll be money printing, which means the dollar will devalue, which means that commodities will increase. I find this to be the most likely outcome, and that's for several reasons. That's for an impending continuous banking crisis. Uh, again, the election cycles, everything else. Now, as to how much it increases, uh, we don't know because that's going to equal uh, rainfall. So we'll have to wait and see. At the time of shooting this video, the next scenario we'll call scenario number two, which is also a likely scenario, although not quite as likely maybe as scenario one, but I can see it for the following reasons. We have a $103.5 index, and we're actually in a bull run market. I think it's going to be 106, then maybe flat or decline. And for that fact, with uh, all this quantitative tightening and cash drying up, that makes the dollar worth more. And when the dollar is worth more, it makes goods cheaper for people, so that means it'll increase. That means commodities are in a down cycle. Now, again, we have a 2024 uh, election coming up. So if you come into 2024, we'll still probably be looking at a Fed pivot, but maybe they won't pivot as much. Maybe they'll just kind of level out or maybe just a slight decline to get sales and cars and things up. And at the same time, maybe the high dollar will allow these things to flourish a little bit. It'll help things plow, but naturally, I don't think the Fed's going to go nuts. Um, and if the dollar increases because of that, one forecast I saw says 110. And that'll mean that commodities will come down and stay down, maybe 3 to $5 range if. And uh, if that's the case, and they'll pick the economy back up out of the hole at the expense of commodities which is also a very likely outcome and again depends how much rainfall you get and the factor of other things now the only reason i'm going with scenario number one as being the most likely uh, event is just because of some banking uh, bank problems um, the government debt and just you know we're starting to see recession uh, fears already so that's going to be the most likely outcome, which would kind of be a repeat of the 08 deal. Maybe a little different. The people just earn a wage, or like a school teacher, someone's earning a government paycheck. It's not going to affect them. If it's it's if you have commercial real estate. So that's why I think scenario one is still more a little more likely. But again, scenario two could very well play out. So it's either going to be a rise in commodities or a fall in commodities. Uh, I really highly doubt we see a sideways uh, trend. After a lot of research, time, and studying, there's 
two outcomes, either a repeat of the year 2008 or a repeat of the year 2013. I would say there's a 60% chance for a repeat of 08 and a 40% chance for a repeat of 13. For the reasons I explained in this video, which would back up those statements. But I like to leave myself with an option. And so in other words, you're kind of 50-50. And if you're 50-50 and you have to have a certain amount of income to protect yourself, there are ways to do that. And that is what I will be working on and possibly talking about in the next video. And there are other things that uh, will influence the markets uh, beyond those possible outcomes. I mean, you're not going to have a repeat exact situation of either. Now let's shoot politics. Did anybody watch this bullshit town hall meeting? Uh, it's all over the internet. Uh, with Trump. Here, let's, let's take a look at this clip. Bring down the cost to make things more affordable. Drill, baby, drill. So he's talking about energy costs. We were soon going to be energy dominant. And nobody had ever done what I did. We got oil down to $1.87. Actually, it fell lower than that in some cases. We had to save the oil companies to, if the price was getting so. We were doing incredibly. We had the greatest economy in the history of our country, probably the greatest economy in the history of the world. We we're energy independent, soon to be energy dominant. We were going to be bigger than Russia and Saudi Arabia put together times two. We have more liquid gold under our feet than any other nation, any other nation. And these stupid fools ended it. And energy went from a dollar eighty-seven and even lower gasoline per car. They went from a dollar eighty-seven to five, six, seven, eight, and even nine dollars. And your electricity bills went through the roof. Your heating bills went through the roof. And that's what started inflation. And it hasn't stopped because people are paying now for bacon and for eggs and for the two and three times what it was just a little while ago. We created the greatest economy in history. Well, if you watch this channel, you know that there's not much bullshit factor. So let's go fact check Donald Trump's statement. Let's just go right here to the EIA website, which tracks pretty much all forms of energy. And by energy, I'm assuming he meant gasoline. We can go over here to where Trump was first president. And we can go up and see our prices were starting to go up. And they went up under Trump after 2018, 19, probably when the Khashoggi murder happened, we crashed it, and then we really went down and plummeted in COVID. And then coming back out of that, obviously we know what happened. But I would say based on this chart that he's full of shit. You can go down through and you can trace all the weekly volume stocks, and you can see where prices were. So let's see when he leaves office. You know, we're going to be around here. So gasoline was already coming up. You know, two, two six. So we're already coming up in price. You know, as we go back here, we're two thirty, so we're already up to two sixty. Now let's roll back to this dollar eighty seven. I'm going to try to find the dollar eighty seven that he keeps talking about. There's sixteen dollar eighty three. Yeah, it looks to me like fuel prices started coming up under him. Then he finally got him. Well, there's almost well, there's over three dollars there. Huh. Interesting. Guess he's just completely full of shit. Drill, baby, drill. I wonder why he never talks about this OPEC 2020 plus deal, which I mean it says right in the deal. You, you can go to Google anywhere. I mean I'm not hiding anything here. It's just very simple to Google. Starting in May 2020, OPEC 2020 plus deal decrease in crude oil by 9.7. Gradually be tapered out through April 2022. He wasn't even in there that end. So in other words, he was still killing the barrels of oil by the time he was long gone. Do you just think maybe a little bit, anybody have a just a general inclination that possibly when you start cutting barrels of oil, that that causes a lesser supply on the market, which might cause the cost to go up? I, I'm just yeah, I'm just wondering, just wondering. So we got U.S. gas and uh, rigs. We got rig count here. Again, let's go over here to, to Trump. Oh shit! We we came in soft, and we went up a little bit, and then we crashed. But why, why is the rig count way less than it was under Obama? 
if he hits this record. Never been done before, crap. So let's go down here in all the years. Let's take a look at the rig count. Let's look in here, 16 era, you know. Let's see where he was. And we can see the rig counts. And you can read the screen yourself. And you can see where we were. Wow, it looks to me like we really we went up high and then we just totally dipped. But why was the highest number way less than it was under Obama? Then we dipped, but then we started coming back up. Huh. We can look here at the bankruptcy filings. This article is written in 2020. Bankruptcy filings skyrocketed. Of course, that COVID destroyed it. Let's look here. Let's look under Forbes. Oh, what's this major article that surfaced? U.S. Energy sourced independent highest over 70 years. And this was just written right then. Second of 2023. Interesting. You know, the problem is, if you drill, you don't have the refining capabilities. We're short on refinery capabilities. Let's go back to the EIA. What refining capabilities? Let's look down through these charts here. And you can see we're actually in declines. We're in a decline. We're in a decline. It's because some of our refineries have gone out of business. So we're in a decline. So you can drill all you want, but we're in a decline as refining capabilities. If you can't refine it, then how's that going to make your gas cheaper? You just got a big pile of oil out there that just can't get refined in time. If you want to make gasoline cheaper, you're going to have to refine it faster. So, not only is he a liar, he's an idiot. He you know, as a, as a just a business owner standpoint, if I'm going to lose money drilling, because it's cheap, I mean, the price of my, the reason I make or want to drill, the reason I want to do anything is because I'm going to make money on it. If you're told you're going to be operating at a loss, why would you want to do it? I mean, you, 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 you wouldn't do it. You would literally lose money by doing it. I mean, drill, baby, drill. Let's, let's get the price down. And he, he, if you he heard him in his little speech where he goes, we had to help the oil companies out. We actually got so low. Yeah, he gave all sorts of credits to the, uh, or destroyed the ethanol industry with all sorts of these little small uh, refinery credits. You, you flooded the market with foreign oil, which caused those bankruptcies to, to take off. I mean, god damn, the guy didn't get markets. They saw it's what's, it was good for the consumer, though, because it was cheaper oil. Cheaper oil, cheaper gasoline. Good for the consumer. Okay, so the price drops till so everything goes broke. And then when it broke, you can no longer get the product anymore. Then it goes way up. So if you ran all the car companies broke except for one, what do you think the price would do on that last remaining car company? What else did he say in this video? We have more oil under, under our feet here in the United States. Well, here's a map. Didn't take a whole hell of a lot of Googling to get here either. I mean, pretty fucking simple. I mean, let's go look maybe like Saudi Arabia someplace. Oh, jeez. More full of shit. America's spot oil price. Gee, there's the years. There's the price. So we are going up. So Trump gets in. And we go actually up. Well, God damn, there's a big plummet right there. I wonder what kind of cover-up happened or what kind of maybe flooding the market scenario happened. Wow, the price fell off the face of the earth during COVID. My God, it's a miracle. Let's cross that over with bankruptcy filings. Do, 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 up, 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 up. So we really started going up around 19, and we just went off the face of the earth in the COVID. Back to farming. So those small oil refiner waivers. Let's see here. Farm income. This is government payments to farmers. What happened under Trump? They started going up. Now, why would government payments go up? If you're making all this money, why would they need to substitute your income with direct government payments? My God, we were already in an incline before COVID hit. Odd. Or maybe the people that think they made a lot of money were mean to look at this chart. So we were pretty much over here. And, you know, some pretty good dips to it. Let's see about when the time that Donald Trump got in there. Wow. Kapoof. I have any farmers on here that are extremely pro-Trump? Let me ask you something. Do you make more money 
for your operation when commodities are high or low? When commodities go up in price, are you able to invest in more things, buy more equipment, improve your house, or do you improve when they go down? I think anybody with an IQ over 7 would tell you that things improve when you make more money. If you work at McDonald's, do you go in and start buying high-end Escalades, mansions, or do you do that once you get a job that pays much better? Any brain-dead dumb fuck could tell you that when you make more money, you have a better quality of life. You eat better, you drive better, nicer things, you own a bigger, better house. So why would an oil company, why would they invest in things? Why would they not invest things in that? Not invest in things. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that if you're making money, you're going to make improvements, you're going to expand operations, hire more people, uh, pay up for more equipment, stuff like that. So if oil's dirt cheap, don't you suppose that might have lingering effects? And if you're so cheap that you can't make a living in it and you owe money on your equipment or maybe the well that you dug and you can't pay your bills, you know what happens? You go bankrupt. And if you go bankrupt and you can't produce, what do you think happens? So for anyone that's thinking that Donald Trump was good for the oil economy, you're wrong. He was terrible for it. And the reason is, is because cheap prices may be good for the consumer as of the moment, but cheap prices lead to problems later. What if two-thirds of the farmers in the United States went broke and the land was tied up in bankruptcy court and nothing could be raised on it? Do you suspect at all that the price of food maybe just skyrocket? Bastards. Oh, Jesus, don't mention the wind turbines. I could be wrong, but... I'm guessing based off of social media, the number one reason that nobody, at least local, wants to wind turbines is because they don't want to look at them, they don't like the roads being put all over the fields, and they're often referred to as visual pollution. However, at the same time, most of the people that are complaining about them, or for that fact, all the people, probably have power in their house. And I'm guessing, based off the conversations I've had with a few of the anti-turbine people, they all complain about their current power bill, wishing it was cheaper. Now, when I talk about turbines on here, this platform, I often get immediately several comments of, well, just use something else. You know, use a nuclear or a coal or whatever it may be. Just use something else. And if you watch my last video, I talked about how even our local food services are dwindling. You are going to limited menus in our grocery store as well as local restaurants or places to get food such as fast food like our Casey's Dollar General stores. Um, even McDonald's has had a little bit of a limited menu compared to ones in cities. You know, select location type stuff. And it's not just a lunch menu. It's goods and services in general. After doing social media enough years and having employees becomes pretty easy to call out bullshit. So, for starters, we can call out BS by saying, has anybody actually checked the power grid? Um, has anybody actually done an engineering study? So, let's go in and compare cost of building a nuclear plant for output and waste and materials or whatever is needed versus building a wind farm. Let's do the same for coal. I would be actually genuinely interested, and this is not being a sarcastic uh, comment. This is being genuinely interested if somebody could lay out the numbers and actually has done the homework, not just spewing headlines, but actually has done the homework and can tell me about the power grids or where or how or what would be uh, the best return on investment. Now, I believe you have to have all forms of energy to become truly energy independent. Uh, and all forms of energy are going to be heavily relied upon renewables what people don't seem to grasp is when they say they don't want something it really means that they don't want the services that they have now and when i say that i mean if somebody walks in their house they throw on their power and they complain about the bill they would really like to have the bill cheaper well to have the bill cheaper you're going to have to have more forms of it just like farming if there was only two farmers left in the united states and they only farmed 100 acres the price of grain would be so exorbitant you couldn't afford it so if you want cheaper you better have more of it Therefore, you better have more of energy if you want cheaper electric bills. But to have that, you are going to have to put up with things that you may not want. 
So, for example, if your local area is deprived of jobs, deprived of general income, tax revenue, you may have to have a turbine in your backyard or something that you don't want to produce the things that you do want. I mean, simple business would be that if you have a larger audience of people or a larger target group that you can sell more product to, then that means you're going to have obviously increased volume, increased revenue. You're going to be able to expand operations and be able to do things. If you don't have those things, you're going to crash and fold. And if you crash and fold, I mean, things are already being congregated to cities. So for any of the locals that don't want to be part of a growing society or growing uh, local economy, ultimately, once you lose services and goods around the area, you are going to have to travel into areas of higher population, meaning you're going to have to go to the city to get things. Additionally, it means less tax revenue, means less road qualities, uh, just all sorts of things will plummet because of the lack of. But I think a lot of the people are complaining the most. They want their little acreage out in the middle of nowhere. They want to be secluded. No neighbors to deal with. They want quite a bit of money. They, they really complain. They want their power and everything, but they they want to complain about the bill. They wish it was cheaper. Um, the ones that maybe don't want power, I, I you don't have to have it now. You can actually opt out. You can have the service company unhook you and produce your own or even produce it and go back into the grid with it. So for those people, uh, I don't see why they're currently hooked up. And I think a lot of them would like to have a new car or whatever and a paved road access to their house. But for one of the reasons why we have to pay more for things in this country is because everybody has, or at least most people that argue with me on this platform, have adopted this not-in-my-backyard mentality. And this mentality is that if, hey, I wanted to wind turbines, well, we don't want those here. We would prefer this nuclear. Well, what do we need to have a nuclear plant? Well, we got to have a water source. we got to have this. we got to have that, stable ground structure. So we go and find a geographic location that allows for construction of this nuclear plant. And then there just so happens to be people in that area who protest it and tell you that they absolutely will do not want or anything to do with a uh, nuclear plant in their backyard. Same with the coal people. Same with anything. Nobody wants anything near them ever. They want to shove it off on the next guy who wants to shove it back off on them. So if nobody can build anything ever because everybody's at each other's throats and they want to pawn it off on the next guy, but at the same time they want everything, then how does that work? Earlier in this video I spoke about, in general, how the economy works in relationship especially to commodities. To expand upon that, uh, and talk politics, Donald Trump had an idea that you could decrease the amount of labor, meaning or the illegals, that would make people that are here legally or citizens of the United States have better opportunities for jobs. So companies have to compete for them. He thought he could bring back manufacturing in the United States, which would mean that there's more jobs for the people. And if they have to compete, then the payroll goes up. And by deregulating, that would entice people to come back and hire uh, these people, and it would trickle on down. And when you let a company make a lot of money, that's basically a trickle-down economics. If you let the top end make the money, then they pay to the lower end based off of supply and demand, which would be to the labor field. What you're looking at here is GDP from the United States uh, from the year 05 till 2022. Now we're in a decline again in 2023, but you can see between, say, 16 to 21, that the only year was high was 21. Uh, 2020 was terrible due to COVID. You can see 08, 09 was when the Great Recession started. Then you can screenshot and you can check the other years. Now, under Donald Trump, we never even hit 3%. Now, the policies I just described is what most people believe that would rise them from oppression and you know the phoenix rising from the ashes under donald trump what they don't understand is that manufacturing and other services are gone from the united states mm -hmm. and they're probably not coming back but what is here are really good gas and oil jobs there's really good jobs in uh agricultural sectors and agriculture is a big one I mean, it goes into rubber iron um, materials i mean there's all sorts of things so if you don't 
build anything here, and you're probably not going to build anything. And if they did build anything here, it'd largely be AI mechanization, not actual labor or a service industry, service country. If you don't have your manufacturing capability and you're probably not going to have it, then your GDP growth and potential would come from doing things that are already here, such as agricultural, mining, raw earth type stuff. You know, take it from the earth, grow it, raise it, pull it out of, produce it. But Trump's mentality was the people needed more money, so he did it at the strings of, I mean, he basically slit the throats of commodities to allow the people to have more money. Like I said earlier, if you're filling up your gas tanks cheaper, that means you have more money to go spend on new clothing or whatever. What that does is it slits the throats on the people that were producing raw earth stuff. So if you kill raw earth things, that's the things that are real money. That's the things that produce. It's the only things that are left here, which does not help your GDP. It actually contracts it. High prices can also hurt. Way too high can also hurt. But a moderate, continuous, good price would allow encouragement and growth in sectors that are raw earth commodity sectors. That's going to boost your GDP, and that's going to allow a lot of jobs in those industries to flourish Instead of trying to bring back 1975, what he should have been doing is worried about protecting what he had here and now and learning how to expand upon it. Now, when Biden became president, uh, he spent a great deal of money. It was labeled under a false pretense of infrastructure. He spent a great deal of money, which basically became crony capitalist uh, expenditures, such as favors to the unions. When in reality, if he'd spent that great amount of money, but maybe he had bought into infrastructure over a period of time, he'd have had a similar outcome, but at least he'd have had investment for future generations. And when you invest in such things as commerce and, and ways of, of uh, you know, getting your grain to market quicker, having ability to haul stuff faster, whatever, then you can increase GDP output by the things we have left. And um, that's, well, sadly, that's not what we got. Now, we're a divided nation. Um... People seem to vote in a way that it's going to be the guy that's going to fight for them. Um, they think that the candidate they've chosen is going to be the guy that fights for them. When you have things like I described to Trump and trickle-down economics and allow a company to make more money, they use AI, uh, slit the throats of the only last going good jobs that are out there in a hope to give it back to the 1% to trickle down to the people, which ultimately just left it in the 1% and line their own pockets. I mean, all candidates have pushed this cheap interest policy stuff, which allows them to look better because it allows companies to buy back their stocks and everything. If you got 2% rate of growth and you borrow money for zero, then, I mean, the money's free. So if you really wanted to fix the country, I mean, you can go clear back to the pre-World War II when we overspent as a nation and they had to take gold away from people's personal ownership. Then you had a depression, you had World War II, you, you came out of World War II a strong leader and became the world's reserve currency because of it, because people were no longer challenged, they became, and they were rich because of it too, but they were no, these things formed, so they became complacent, they became lazier. You know, when, one, when dad's down working at the factory and mom doesn't have to work, she can just raise the kids, they have a nice new house, a new car, the American dream is alive and flourishing, times are easier which ultimately builds softer people going forward. Now we fast forward to 71, to where we just went broke again, and then we just, instead of going broke, we just removed our our uh, system of money, which was gold, and replaced it with another system of money, the fiat system. And on down a poor path we went. The only flare-up we had uh, of modern society that was really any good was the um, dot-com era, which then crashed and burnt, and then final, the final crash was in 08. We went into the basically depression that we've never really recovered from since. But, you know, you take that dot-com boom era combined with 9-11 and the fuel prices, and people were already running out of money, and the printing was getting heavy, and manufacturing's down the drain, populations have exploded. Just all these things have piled up in the last 20 years have not been a very good picture. But to be able to reverse all that, it's going to have to reverse a lot of people's mentality, um, I mean, ultimately, that's a reverse population. There's just really no hope to reverse it. There are ways to alter it. 
Um, and for farming, my base case, or the argument, or what I wanted to talk about anyway, was in farming, if you are having to find other ways to use your land to generate the wealth that the land would have once made otherwise, then you're going to have to do other things with the land. And the only thing knocking on our doorstep out here in our area is the wind turbines, which have seemingly caught a lot of grief. So I guess if you really want to compare it to generations previous, um, you can just say that you're going to make less per acre, which means more acres of volume to equal your same take-home living. And if you're one of the farmers who's had a continuous rate of acre gains, then you're probably not complaining because you're probably making a decent take-home income and the equipment is a little bigger all the time. So you're able to handle a little more, a little faster. But if you've been in a sustained uh, size category, uh, then you're slowly dying or you're looking for alternative ways of making income. I would personally like to go back to like, say, 500 acres or 400 acres. Uh, I could farm with, uh, you know, 44, 30 size and under equipment, six row planter or whatever, um, and be very happy about it if I could make an income for the family and have a new vehicle and fix the house and stuff. up. But you just, you literally cannot do it. You just can't farm like you did previous. There's just not there because, and the reason it's not there is because it's what you make per acre is not there. In one of my last videos, I spoke about how Case IH eliminated their 5150 combine, which was one of the last small combines available on the market. But when you compare a Class 5 machine at $570,000 cash to a X9 John Deere at $890,000 cash, that's a Class 10 combine, literally almost does twice the work. Um, you gotta consider how many acres you can put through that machine versus the price tag. And with the lack of good labor or skilled labor, it's easy to see why companies are going the directions they are. That's why the six row planter's been eliminated. That's why the six row planters that do remain, I select the brands, are only available with like base level options. Um, that's why the small combine's gone. The smaller farmer does not have the ability to purchase this newer equipment, and it's proportionally priced too high. You can clearly see from the manufacturer's standpoint where the direction of agriculture is going. Less operators, meaning less farmers, doing more volume. Obviously, it's more volume, not more per acre. So if you are moving in that direction, you need to determine why are we moving direction and there's a lot of reasons we're moving in that direction uh, such things as monopolies and the government I mean if you look at like wanting to start a food company which would use commodities or what farmers produce uh, you really can't it, it's very hard to get through all the uh, food drug crap through the government where you, you have to be to get certified even during COVID we saw a great deal of people saying well I'll just take my animal down to the locker and then the lockers got swelled up because the packing plants are shut down. Um, and they said, well, well, we'll just get a little more, a little bigger in the locker. You know, we'll, we'll hire a couple more people and we can, you know, this this uh, local growing stuff's the new thing. Um, this is the direction we'll go. And what happened was the government says, no, 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 these are unsanitary conditions. You have a limitation and you, you cannot expand your operation size, which is why I talked about the 8,800 head per day packing plant in the last video. You need competition. So to grow in farming, you need more volume, meaning more acres, or you need a subsidiary business, meaning a side income of some sort, and whether that is something that your land can produce, such as a water line, a turbine, maybe an earth or a mineral, whatever your land has on it, some farms even have oil, or starting a completely secondary business, part-time, or even working a town job, just any form of additional income. And if you do not have the ability for any of those, then you likely are stale or going into retraction. And if that's the case, um, you're probably having to do a little more with a little less, meaning you're having to buy a little older equipment all the time, not able to do the things your grandparents maybe did. Uh, such as build the house on the farm or buy the new tractor. We are declining as a nation. That's all there is to it. People are getting poorer. And 
And if you're a farmer, you're becoming more resourceful, doing more with less all the time. It's just slow. I have a lot of younger viewers that don't see it. And just because they don't see it doesn't mean it didn't happen. That's been a skewed um, perception based on the fact it didn't happen in their lifetime. Doesn't mean it didn't happen many times before. It's the rise and fall of empires, which is pretty much what happened to Rome. When I was a kid, my grandfather would talk about people who were reluctant to hook up to the power grid. Uh, people that did not want to be on a phone service. Maybe they still had lanterns in the house and didn't want uh, to switch them to what they considered modern electricity. I remember 8-track uh, tape players and vehicles uh, and, and some vehicles, I mean that was a luxury at the time. Some vehicles had AM radios in them if they had a radio at all so it's a steel plate on the dash. By the time the late 90s, early 2000s came around, you know a cassette uh, deck became a CD player and and you had Windows 98 at home, we thought we were pretty uptown living and, and we were, you know, we're, we're rural people so we were out here living uh, with this cutting edge technology is to have even dial up internet and a Windows 98 computer. Uh, we didn't have fax at the time, we didn't have a lot of things. Uh, maybe certain sectors would look down upon us and think, wow, how backwards could you be? And for that fact, I know people even to current date that still don't have like a rural water hookup when somebody in the city, uh, they're on a well. And, and people in the city would look at that or consider and say, my God, what, what do you do? I, I can't leave, you know, I don't just pay your monthly water and gas and have automatic everything. Well, it's a different lifestyle. There's always uh, different people and different uh, ways of life. If sometimes it can take a very long time for all fascists of humans to uh, adopt certain technologies. Uh, so obviously people adapt and they change over time as civilizations rise. Uh, it keeps things interesting. I mean, get in a time machine and just go back a short distance in, in human history, maybe just a couple hundred years, and they were facing starvation or, or a, uh, some sort of plague that's treatable very easily by modern day standards. So things change and they keep it interesting uh, and it will continue to change. And I really think that one of those changes that's going to be coming, whether people like to hear it or not, is renewables are coming. They are uh, going to be picking up um, steam in the future. And, and I think there'll be some new ones that we've not even heard of, I mean, emerge. Uh, the, like I said, the world is always changing. Now back to the matter at hand where the video started, uh, talking about grain prices, you know, things change as I have uh, connected the data points to show that corn is 435 for years and we're really have to be in an upswing. I think a number of things have taken place worldwide that have not changed. We came in with a flash in the pan after a devaluation of currency. I firmly believe we're in the year 2008, which will be followed by the 1970s. Therefore, meaning uh, we are seeing a recession, stagflation environment. At the same time, we we, we had it because of a uh, large devaluation of wealth, or basically our dollar went down the went down the toilet with Joe Biden overprinted. Uh, that's the way to put it in a nutshell. But I, I think because of that, and because of these other things setting up worldwide, that we will see corn level out at the very low end of four, maybe four and a quarter. Um, that would be like the very lowest and the very highest would be seven dollars. So I would really expect to see corn, you know, on a continuous, uh, if you average that out, 525 area. And I think soybeans will be at, you know, say 12.75 to 15 dollars. Um, a couple of other reports I've gotten on that reflect about a 1375 consistent average and that's that's going to be elevated from previous but if you figure inflation based in on that we've really not moved up at all it's just a, um, a new wave of income levels it's kind of like what happened in the 70s into the 80s we had so much inflation that you came out of it with the same standard of living and in a higher tax bracket but no more expensive one of the new things to agriculture that 
I've talked about previously and why I think the fundamentals are there to support my theory is the carbonless fuel program. Uh, that's going to be the new boom and it'll eventually it'll mature. It's like the ethanol industry is now. It was the new boom and then it matured. Uh, but, you know, before it became old news, you had a, uh, a heightened price. Um, in a sense, we're back to 350 corn and $10 beans. Or just like I say, we're doing it on a new level because uh, so anybody that bought anything previous, pre-COVID, I mean, there's pre-COVID money and there's after COVID money because they printed so much money. The currency is the same, but it's kind of different in buying power. I mean, it happened so fast the buying power changed so drastically just overnight but if you bought anything pre-covid you're, you're probably in good shape but if you bought anything now you basically have the equivalent to what you made before which was just getting by so you can't expand the farm there's all sorts of exceptions there's all sorts of subsidiary businesses all sorts of variables to every operation um, but in a nutshell uh, hopefully you've caught the message at this point if you're just a farmer and farmer only the opportunity you once had is not there anymore as far as presidents I don't think that any of them have helped in a long time and I think it's getting worse I think that a lot of politicians get in there now realize that it's a complete shambled joke with there's no hope so they just line their own filthy pockets and get out so in a sense kind of doesn't matter who ends up winning. Uh, what you have to do personally, if you want to capitalize on it, is figure out which way the political party will sway as to where the investments or what you should do to capitalize as what things are going to pass, you know, such as maybe you're going to get a um, Democrat in there, they're going to be more push for renewables, and that would be something to invest in. Um, the smartest people that make the most adapt to their environment and capitalize off it. Well, hopefully this gives you an idea of where markets are and where they'll possibly go, based on at least my opinion. Uh, time will tell. Uh, I did mention in previous videos that I thought that we would knock off uh, this year's highs. I see corn's previous high for us, I mean at least the local ethanol plant, the highest of that plant was 7-Eleven. I still think we'll pass it here at some point this summer. And soybeans, I believe, hit a high of 15.65 locally. And that could be a stretch to hit those, but I think we'll be close. Uh, and that all depends upon the drought. We are getting dry here in Western Iowa again. Uh, no subsoil from last year, uh, and the, all the I states are dry. Iowa, Indiana, Illinois, and when the I states go dry, uh, you'll see volatility in the markets. And for good reason, because, I mean, our, our corn crop, and especially our soybeans, could use a drink of water right now, and there's really nothing in the two-week forecast except for a lot of hot and dry weather, and there's a big dome overhead that's going to sit here and roast on us for a while. And being uh, 16 inches short last year on, on uh, we, we never caught up from that. So there's no subsoil moisture there. We haven't been overly abundant this year. Now we got another dome overhead. Uh, kind of in the fryer. So we'll see and take it day by day. And if you do want to do the, if you do want to know the new crop uh, corn, um, I still think that we'll get to at least six dollars and thirty cents cash price at most elevators in western Iowa um, for new crop at some of the months. You know maybe in June next year or something we'll probably see that this July. So if, say this July comes up you get six thirty or over six dollars for your next year's uh, corn crop yeah, you might go ahead and place that if you remain hot and dry at that point uh, buy a call option with it if they'll allow you to and um, that way you got a little upside uh, potential anyway it's a 12 year bull cycle um, we're probably in a, about year three maybe two and a half three so we got a few more good years probably 2030 maybe will be around towards the end of it 2031 somewhere in there um, it'll start to level back off pay off your shit do what you can and uh, put yourself into a good situation and that'll allow you to expand by that point in time okay it's been an hour and a half in if you 
that's paid attention to the end. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions or would like to debate this video with me, uh, put your comments below and I will do my best to answer or possibly produce a uh, reply video, likely on the second channel. And we can talk more and I usually give out my email address in the description, if not down in the comments for those who like to correspond directly with me. Uh, and again, thanks for watching. See you in the next one.